My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask pardon for my sins and the grace to make these moments of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. In the Gospel of today's Mass, we come across Jesus around Jerusalem again, and it seems that he was walking in from the northeast, through the Sheep Gate, and nearby a pool which the Gospel calls Bethsatha, although I've read that it was actually more commonly referred to as Bethesda. Excavations in the area suggest that it would have been a double pool with five large porticos that held a large number of people. The passage begins as follows. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew Bethsatha, which has five porticos. And these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take up your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. As we hear this story, we again pause to think about what Jesus saw and did there. And Lord, for my part, I like to think that you were walking among some sort of hustle and bustle around the area, not something ridiculously busy like the centre of one of our 21st century cities, but a place where there was a lot of coming and going. And it seems like in amongst that hustle and bustle, you weren't only thinking about how to get to where you were going, but you're actually looking at the people around you, thinking of them, of the things that they have on their minds and in their hearts. After all, it would have been so easy to walk past that sick man lying by the pool. It seems that most people did. But you don't just walk past. You stop to talk to him. It's one more way that you seem to show how much you see what we don't. We so often see things that are difficult or that cost, or at least that cost time. Certainly in my part of the world, people are easily obsessed about time. We're all convinced of the importance of what we're doing and how we can't afford extra delays and unexpected things and we just walk straight past so many good people at our side. But you look and see a soul who can bring glory to God. How dumb we are when we just see people around who could delay us instead of people who could give everything to you. And when we look with your eyes at those people around the pool in today's Gospel, what do we see? We find a group of souls gathered together at a pool called Bethesda, which means something like House of Mercy or House of Pity. And this pool is found near the Sheep Gate. Okay, Jesus, forgive the poetic license, but I can't help see a reflection here of so many of your flock who sit at the threshold of mercy. They are almost there, but just lack the last something to get them back in union with you. And then I think of my own surroundings, and I have to admit that there are a lot of people around us who seem to fit that description. People on the threshold of mercy who seem to be awaiting the last something to get them close to you. The truth is that that something, the thing which people need in order to make that transition to the house of mercy, is nothing other than confession. But sometimes there's a bit of reluctance in the soul. That's one of the most amazing things about confession. In any other way, we can basically sweep our sins under the carpet, and that's not good. It means that we never really have to face up to them, and can in fact end up just kind of ignoring a festering wound that just gets worse and worse, even though in reality we do want to be back in the house of God's mercy. Going to confession implies a real and concrete acceptance of our sin. And that's something which should be so simple, logical, and easy. But the reality is that sometimes it's hard. Certainly, 
I remember when I was looking for God, beginning to think about converting. I was talking with a good friend of mine, a girl who helped me in the end to come to the faith. And I don't remember what it was exactly that she told me, but we were driving home one day, and she mentioned something about the idea of sin, and that I needed forgiveness. And I looked at her in a certain sense, a bit affronted to be perfectly honest, because I thought to myself, I think I said to her exactly this, that, well, what? I mean, therefore, you think that I am a sinner? I mean, I was brutally offended. I thought it was horrible that she couldn't imply that I was a sinner. But then she laughed. And I said, so what are you laughing about? And she sort of explained to me in the way that a person can when they know more than you do, that a certain thing takes place in the conversion of any soul, which is the realization of sin. And that certainly was my case. When I came close to God, when I started to find him, I started to realize what sin was and how it was present in my own life. That realization, in a certain sense, costs us because it means accepting something about ourselves that we don't want to accept. But we always win when we do. Sometimes it costs a lot to accept the reality of our own sin, and we end up delaying confession ceaselessly, or just turning away from it, pushing it into the background in the hope of forgetting about sin and moving on to other things. But the reality is that in confession, we have peace and freedom. We know that we are right with God, and actually, we know also that we are right with ourselves. When we accept our sin for what it is, without worrying about it, or thinking that it makes God turn away from us, or something like that, we have peace. We're not fighting with ourselves, forever trying to convince ourselves that the reality is not what it is. With a good confession, and even better by going to confession regularly, we know ourselves better, and also have the joy of knowing that God is happy with us as we are. It's actually by going back to ask forgiveness, by going back to confession, that we experience God's forgiveness. The more we experience that forgiveness, the more we realize how complete it is, and the less we are worried about our own defects. It's one of those eccentricities of the interior life, that we know God loves us even with our defects, but we struggle to love ourselves with our defects. We struggle, therefore, to accept them, and we superimpose that vision on God. We think that He also struggles with our defects, but nothing could be more opposite from the truth. God not only accepts us as we are, faults, sins and all, but loves us as we are, faults, sins and all. He just asks us to come home, home to the house of mercy, in order to experience his forgiveness firsthand. Then, Jesus, I keep looking at the gospel, and I hear you calling the sick man, asking him, do you want to be made well? And when I hear that, I know that you never stop calling souls, including the souls around me. But, as this man says, I don't have anyone to help me. We want to change that. We want to be that person around others who can help them. And the reality is that we can do a lot of good for souls by bringing them back to confession. But how do we do it? That sometimes seems more difficult. One of the best things we can do is not simply to encourage someone to return to confession, tell them that it would be a good idea or something, but to open up and be sincere about the way that confession helps us. Even about the way that sometimes it can be difficult to accept something, but that it's always worthwhile. Perhaps then, as we finish our prayer, there are two things that we might ask of Our Lady. Firstly, we ask you, Our Mother, for the help to get to confession with all the simplicity and joy of someone who knows that they are not only a child of God, but a child whom he loves deeply. And secondly, we ask you also for the help we need to carry out a really fruitful apostolate of confession, helping many other souls who dwell at that threshold of mercy to cross the divide and to experience the forgiveness of God. 
I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this time of prayer. I ask your assistance in putting them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.